What's up? What's up? How y'all doing? Well, Skip What's ditched me. On? Skip ditched me for the tease. He he was gone, and he hasn't said anything to me yet. But he's just, I skip. A, he's, just a, he's just a he's just a little bit emotional he's this morning. He's ignoring me. You know, my 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 condolences, Skip. The smile is not because the Spurs lost. It's because I'm near South Beach. You know what time it is. You know, so that that that's what the smile is for, Skip. Let's that's just what get the this over for. with. That's all it is. Skip, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we love you. <laughs> oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wish us all just, luck. Just ask the question. Okay, ask okay. the question. <laughs> this, sorry, the Thunder closed in six. Someone yeah. here predicted that, eliminating the Spurs after a 113-99 win in game six last night. OKC jumped all over San Antonio in the first half and led by 24 points at halftime. The Spurs did make a late fourth quarter run to make it interesting, but it wasn't enough to catch the Thunder. Stephen A., what happened to those Spurs? They got overwhelmed in the second quarter, and they really couldn't recover from that. Over the last uh, three games of this series, they just look old. They, they looked old um, and, and not nearly as productive as you had anticipated that they would look. Uh, in the case of Tim Duncan, that did not apply to him in game six last night. If this were indeed his last game, he went out the way a champion is supposed to go out. I thought he played a really good game considering uh, the circumstances. But, you know, when uh, when Andre Robertson is ending up hitting uh, uh, three three-pointers, uh, you know it's a bad, bad night coming your way if you're going up against the Oklahoma City Thunder. And, and the Spurs couldn't hit a shot, couldn't get anything going. Uh, Kevin Durant and Russell Westbrook were absolutely sensational. Kevin Durant finishes with 37. Russell Westbrook's finish was 28. Uh, you know, you just looked at it and you just 30 to 12 in the second quarter, 15 to three run to close out the half. Kevin Durant hitting that three to end the half. They just seemed locked in. They seemed focused. They were like sharks in blood infested waters. They smelled blood. Uh, they knew what time it was. They came to finish the deal. And San Antonio, for some inexplicable reason, came out relatively flat. You expected them to play, as Skip had pointed out, angry with Danny Green and those boys doing what they're capable of doing. But that wasn't the case. Oklahoma City was ex expecting an onslaught from San Antonio. They were expecting them to come out with fervor and energy, and they were ready to respond. And by the time the second quarter rolled around, when they run it, when they ran up the score and outscored them 30 to 12 and went up by 24, 25 at halftime, it was pretty much a wrap from there. San Antonio did come back. You knew that they were going to have those kind of guts where they would make it interesting. But in the end, you're not going to have that kind of deficit against Oklahoma City in OKC, and that's something that they're going to lose. And that's what happened. The talent that they have, the youth, the size, the physicality, it all came together at the most appropriate time. And that's why they're going to the Western Conference Finals and the San Antonio Spurs are going home. You expected Lamarcus Aldridge to negate that. He wasn't up to the task. You expected Kawhi Leonard to negate that. He wasn't up to the task. And you knew the big three, uh, Duncan and Ginobili and Parker, weren't going to be up to the task either. So it is what it is. Okay. <clears throat> Before I unleash, I, I want to congratulate, I'm going to congratulate Molly. She predicted correctly, what would you say, in six? Way to go, Molly. I'm sure you were thinking that after the first three games. I want to congratulate the Oklahoma City Thunder for being better than my San Antonio Spurs. I especially want to congratulate Kevin Durant for being the best player on the floor in this series. And last night, when it mattered most, Kevin Durant was virtually unstoppable. I want to congratulate Steven Adams for having a breakout series against my Spurs. I thought he was sensational from start to finish, played hard, played athletic, dominated the backboards on offense and defense. I even want to congratulate Andre Robertson for doing the job that he did on Kawhi Leonard because I thought he was spectacular defensively on the Defensive Player of the Year two times. And I want to congratulate Billy Donovan. I thought he pushed all the right buttons in this series as a rookie NBA head coach. Way to go, way to go, way to go. Now, forgive me for this, Mr. Smith, but this whole notion that I keep hearing, not just from you, but from all the analysts, that all of a sudden my spurs looked old and slow and unathletic, I got to tell you, it's flat out laughable to me because allow me to put this in some perspective. My Spurs won 67 games in the regular season. That's tied for seventh best all time. And my Spurs won the first game of this series, 124 to 92 by 32 points. 
And my Spurs then went up in game three to Oklahoma City and won impressively in game three to take a two games to one lead in the series. My Spurs were in position. My old, slow, unathletic Spurs were in fourth quarter position to win all five of the first five games. And the NBA itself admitted that it blew two calls in the final minute of the pivotal game five in San Antonio that helped cost my Spurs that game and helped cancel out two late humongous Oklahoma City right on schedule turnovers, one by Russell Westbrook and one by Kevin Durant. And I want to remind everyone for perspective going into last night's game that my old, slow, unathletic San Antonio Spurs opened as a two and a half point favorite to win game six at Oklahoma City. And I also want to keep it in perspective to your point, Mr. Smith, about the start of last night's game. I'm, I'm not going to say they came out and played angry, but I saw Spurs. I, I saw vintage San Antonio Spurs for the first eight minutes of that game. They led 19 to 13. They were locked in, and I thought they were pretty much in control of that game. 19 to 13 with four minutes left in the first quarter. Now, to your point, from that point through the second quarter until halftime, so that's four minutes plus 12 minutes. For the next 16 minutes, trust me on this. You'll say it's hyperbole, but it's not. It was the sorriest, saddest stretch in Spurs playoff history. And I should know, I have been a diehard Spurs fan since the George Gervin era, long before my city, Oklahoma City, even thought about having a professional basketball team, an NBA team. I was a Spurs fan, and in all the Spurs playoff games I've ever watched, given the circumstances, given what had happened in the first five games, given that they were up 19-13 to 13 in Game 6 at Oklahoma City, a place that in 2014 they won Game 6 to get to the NBA Finals, this was as devastating, as, as mind-blowing, as stomach-turning, as inexplicable a stretch as I have ever seen. I have no logic. I don't, I don't have reason for it. I, I, I couldn't sleep because I couldn't figure it out. But in that stretch, they got outscored 42 to 12. My San Antonio Spurs, who won 67 games and who had won two of the first three games, 42 to 12. They shot five of 28 in that stretch. That's 16 percent. 16 percent. Five for 28. It's it's mind blowing to me, Stephen A., that nobody could make a shot. It, it, it's shot after open shot. LaMarcus Aldridge couldn't make a shot. Tim Duncan couldn't make a shot. Kawhi Leonard couldn't make a shot. I, I just sat there in awe of how, how inexplicable, inexplicably awful this stretch was. And to your point, it was ball game. It was over at halftime. Obviously, my Spurs snapped out of it in the second half. And they actually won the second half 68 to 58. They scored 34 and 34 in the third and fourth quarter. They scored 19 and 12 in the first two quarters. 19 and 12, so it's 68 points in the second half to 31 in the first half. That, that's, the, that's the biggest discrepancy of points scored in a half in the last 15 years in the NBA playoffs. It's, it's baffling to me. I don't know unless maybe they fell into the LaMarcus Aldridge trap in the first two games in which he made 33 of 44 shots and they just got so dependent on LaMarcus that they kept lobbing the ball into him and all of a sudden the stage got too big for him as we've talked about for the last three days on this show. I, I, I sat there wondering where is Boris Diaw? He has been instant offense for my Spurs all year long and for the last four or five years. When you needed quick points you went to Boris. He played zero minutes last night. I don't know if he's hurt I don't know if he got doghoused by Coach Popovich. I don't know. But, but I kept saying, somebody do something because this team is too good to be that bad. But they were that bad, and all of a sudden, because they lost it, then they lost the game, and they lost the series, and they did so so inexplicably because they were so good in other stretches of this series. But I don't want to hear that they suddenly got old and slow and athletic. I've been hearing that for the last, what, five or six years about this team? And, and again, when this team loses, it always looks old and slow and unathletic. Problem is, it hasn't lost all that much over the last five or six years. 
it looked bad last night, but I don't think it's because of age and attrition. We're going to talk about it later, but I, I, I won't be surprised if Tim Duncan and Manu Ginobili come back next year because, <clears throat> truthfully, big picture, they both had very good years. You can say they didn't have great playoffs. Duncan, as you point out, was very good last night by his playoff standards. But again, mm -hmm. that stretch did in my San Antonio Spurs in ways that I have never, ever seen before from this franchise in this kind of well, moment. Well, let me say this to you respectfully. I don't believe you. And I will tell you why. By giving you specific dates. May 25th, 2001. And then two days later, May 27th, 2001. It was the second of the three peak for the Los Angeles Lakers with Shaquille O'Neal and Kobe Bryant in them. If you recall, that was a night, I believe it was a Friday night, where the Los Angeles Lakers ran the San Antonio Spurs out of the Staples Center. They went up, they won the game 111 to 72. And Jack Nicholson, J J Jack Nicholson was literally looking at the camera with the choke sign, take their heart, take their heart. And Tim Duncan was sitting on the bench looking like he was about to cry with Greg Popovich patting him on the shoulders. I believe that run was far more profound than what we saw last night because in games three and four of that series, the Lakers won 111-72. And then followed it up with the four game sweep winning 111 to 82. I think when you talk about you've never seen the Spurs that is bad as you saw them through that 16 minute stretch last night, I would beg to differ. Can, can, can now, I, can having I respond? said all of that, may I respond? Sure. sure. I, I was at that game sure, and please. covered that series. Completely different than what we saw last night. How? Those Spurs How? had no chance against those Lakers. And I've told you before, that stretch by Shaquille O'Neal was the most dominating single-player stretch I've ever witnessed in the history of basketball. That's just me. He was invincible. He was unstoppable. Neither David Robinson nor Tim Duncan or the combination thereof could begin to deal with Shaquille O'Neal and, and, to a certain extent, Kobe Bryant, obviously, is, is the one-two punch. But, Stephen A., those, that's a sweep. That's no hope. That wasn't because the Spurs were inept and they couldn't make shots. They had no chance against that team. It was a mismatch. This clearly was no mismatch because we'd seen five games already that the Spurs were in position in the fourth quarter to win. They, they were well, good enough to, to do this. This wasn't about that's the, the I, Thunder. It, you that's know? a fair dichotomy. Okay. That, that, that's, a fair, that's fair. Fine, fine enough. That's fair. Okay. But I think what you're missing, well, I think what you're also missing is that skip. Nobody's being disrespectful to the San Antonio Spurs. And you are right in terms of saying, you know, folks have counted them out before. But why did we count them out before? When we looked at the San Antonio Spurs and you wondered how much Tim Duncan had left, okay, you contemplated whether or not he was going to retire. You wondered at time because Manu Ginobili was hurt a few years ago. He wasn't 100% when he went up against the Heat and what have you. You wondered about his future as well. And then those were the things that prompted the questions. But yep. You didn't have that extra dust on the, on the birth certificate. And a lot of times, I remember Kobe said this to me. Kobe came into this season possibly entertaining playing two additional years, Skip. Literally possibly entertaining playing two yep. additional years. And he went out there, Skip, one night and said, damn, it's gone. I don't have it anymore. And so when, what happens is, is that... It's, it's not always a gradual regression that takes place. Sometimes you literally wake up and it's like, it's over. What I was and what I could do, I can't do it anymore. And I think that when you look at the Spurs from game three and how slowly but surely, methodically speaking, the regression appeared to take place as, as Oklahoma City's youth and enthusiasm and physicality ultimately was taking over and dictating this series. I think that's what you have to pay attention to here. So certainly, Tim Duncan can make a contribution and Manu Ginobili can make a contribution, et cetera, et cetera. But I also think it's also piggybacking off of what we saw from Kobe. How many times did you sit right there in that chair, Skip, literally sad to the point where it was breaking your heart? to watch Kobe because the guy that you once knew was no more. And I'm saying it just, it can't, bam, it's here, it has arrived. 
it looked like that is what happened to the San Antonio Spurs as this season waned. Not in terms of their ability, not in terms of their willingness to, and their ability to play together, but it was just something so flagrantly missing from their legs, their youth, their energy, their vibrancy. It wasn't something that was sustainable over the course of 48 minutes through the games. And I think that's what people are looking at when they're saying, damn, this, this, this very well could be it. Tim Duncan, last night, Skip, you know this better than most. That was all heart, man. That was the heart of a champion. Coming out and saying, I'm not going out like this. You know, zero point game, two point game, one field goal, et cetera, et cetera. This is the brink of elimination. I'm not having this. That's what that was. That that is what okay. that was. That was something special that the rare, the rare ones can pull out of their hat. But it but that's what it is. Okay. I I've told you now for two weeks, Tim Duncan back it was late January and then it, it sort of bled into February. He hurt his good knee. He's had one bad knee that he's been able to work around and play at a high level. I don't know because they are pretty close mouth, tight lipped about this. I'm not sure how bad it was. I'm, I'm going to guess he needs some sort of surgery on his quote unquote good knee. And he missed eight games and tried to come back and played okay down the stretch of the season. But clearly, he lost it offensively where he had no more spring at all to the basket, where, where he became a liability going to the basket. You could almost dare him to go to the basket, and he couldn't. I agree with you. On guts and guile and sheer will, part of a champion, he scored 19 points last night. My disappointment was, and I also told you this, Tony Parker of the Big Three is still young enough to be a contributor. And obviously, it's a point guard driven game now with Russell Westbrook and Steph Curry. And, you know, it's, it's just the, the way the game is played. It's been turned upside down. There were times two, three, four years ago, I thought Tony Parker was the best point guard. At the end of game four in Oklahoma City, if you'll recall, Tony Parker had a collision in the lane and went down, and it looked like he had hurt himself badly. It looked like he turned his ankle or something was wrong with his lower leg, and he limped back up court but finished the game, and then he kept playing through the series, and he lost his burst. The problem last night to me was he couldn't get in the lane at all on anybody. Whoever guarded him could keep him out of the lane. And you know what happens when you can't get in the lane, because Durant and Westbrook were just getting in the lane at will last night on my, my spurs, and it creates havoc. You can't stop it because everybody else gets open from it. Tony Parker could not create open shots off his dribble, dribble, dribble. It cost him, obviously, at the end of game five when he had two big chances to win the game and wound up with a late, rushed, indecisive jump shot that didn't even sniff the rim or sniff going, in through, going into the basket, obviously. And in, in this case, last night, he became a liability more than Ginobili and, and Duncan did. I, I will give you that. I'll also give you, I've, I've raved all year about Jonathan Simmons being a young, stud, athletic, explosive player. This is pop. This is your issue with him. He's going to ride the veterans home, the guys who got him there. You know, he's going to dance with who brung him. And in this case, you know, D Jonathan Simmons didn't dress for this series. So he's just saying he's a kid. He doesn't know how to play. And maybe he would have helped last night. I don't know. But that stretch, when I'm, I'm looking at what happened in that stretch where they went cold, David West 0 for 3, LaMarcus 1 for 4, Kawhi 1 for 5, Tim Duncan 0 for 4. You're going to lose, man. At Oklahoma City, they're going to go crazy, and they did go crazy because they, you, you're right. They smelled your blood. They started getting out off your misses on the break, and it's over in front of that crowd in that building. Well, let's also keep in mind that LaMarcus Aldridge was supposed to be the quintessential successor to, Dave, uh, to Tim Duncan. And even though he ultimately finished with a few points, he had about 18 points, yeah. the bottom line is clear. You know, you expect more from him. In a game of that magnitude, you ex it's not enough to be good. It's not enough to be decent. You need to be a star. LaMarcus Aldridge, 6 feet 11, LaMarcus Aldridge shot 9 of 18 from the field, 18 points, decent numbers. Here's the problem. He did not get to the free throw line one time. No. Nope. At no time. Did he put himself in a position to stop the bleeding? That's something Tim Duncan would have done. That's what LaMarcus Aldridge has to work on. I agree. 
All right, let's leave it there. Now it's on to the next one for those Thunder. Now they weren't able to defend Steph Curry in the regular season. Will they be able to do it in the conference finals? That's the question when we come back. First take, just getting started.